next on Secrets of War. Kennedy versus Khrushchev on the brink of oblivion. How close the superpowers actually came to nuclear holocaust. A terrifying doomsday machine built to end the world and new information on brutal power struggles behind the Iron Curtain. Nuclear madness and the Cold War. The strange love factor is next on Secrets of War. October 31st, 1961. Novaya Zemla, an island in the Soviet Arctic. Top secret nuclear test ground 2,500 miles from the United States. A Tu-95 Soviet strategic bomber carried a new means of mass destruction. And this hydrogen bomb was the most powerful weapon ever built by man. Its destructive power was equal to 50 million tons of TNT. Its creator, the Soviet Union, was locked in a mortal struggle with the West. A worldwide political and economic conflict known as the Cold War. We have announced that we have a 100 megaton bomb. Yes, we have. I confirm it. But we are not going to test it, because if we explode it where we intend, we could break our own windows too. The Cold War was rooted in ideology, deep distrust, and fear. In the struggle between communist tyrannies and Western democracies. In the early part of the century, the Western allies, particularly Britain and America, had shown their antipathy to communism, sending invasion forces to Russia. By the 1930s, they distrusted Stalin and his ruthless secret agencies. They feared his power and his designs on the West. The Nazis had seemed a powerful barrier to the Bolshevik tide, but had revealed their true vicious intent and had to be defeated. The old ideological enemies made strange and distrustful allies. Even during World War II, the alliance with the Soviets was a match made in hell. Stalin felt, not without reason, that the West would happily let the Nazis and the Soviet communists bleed each other to death. At Yalta in February 1945, Stalin agreed with Churchill and U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt to jointly conquer Berlin. But then, on the 17th of April, Stalin secretly decided to take Berlin alone. With a sudden push, and with the loss of 600,000 Soviet soldiers, the Russians captured the city. Having paid such a colossal price, Stalin tried to keep the prize. Germany was divided into occupation zones. The British, Americans, and the French controlled the West. Berlin was situated in the Soviet zone, miles behind Russian lines. Now the Allies would have to bargain with a Russian dictator to claim what had been agreed upon. But what did the Allies have to bargain with? 
Their troops were exhausted, hoping to go home at last. But the task of rebuilding Europe still lay ahead. They were also engaged in a brutal war with the Japanese. U.S. President Harry Truman had already arrived in Potsdam in July for a victory conference when he received a secret message. The baby is born. It was a code. The first American nuclear bomb had been tested, and it worked. The nuclear age had arrived, and with it, the nuclear threat. Truman immediately informed Stalin that the United States had a super weapon. Stalin gave no indication that he understood what Truman was talking about, but he already knew from his spies inside the American Manhattan Project. The first nuclear bluff was that Stalin did not show his fear. Months later, Truman would use that bomb to end the war against the Japanese. The successful American test had changed the odds at the Potsdam summit, Stalin had to return three quarters of Berlin to his former allies. Stalin kept the East, the allies got the West. Before long, Stalin realized he'd made a mistake. The US Marshall Plan revitalized and rebuilt Western Europe. Berlin was a beacon of freedom in a tyrannical communist state. The standard of living in West Berlin rapidly rose much higher than that in the East. U.S. aid was offered to Stalin, but fearful of Western influence behind the Iron Curtain, he turned it down. Eastern Europe would have to rebuild as a collection of impoverished Soviet-ruled states. Hundreds of thousands of Germans fled to the West. Nothing the communists did could stop them. Facing a growing crisis, Stalin developed a simple, ruthless plan. Surrounded by communist territory, West Berlin depended on rail and road corridors. Stalin decided to starve the Berliners into submission. Suddenly, all traffic arteries were cut off. Neither trains nor trucks could get into besieged Berlin. Planes still flew, but Stalin expected Berlin, with its 2,500,000 inhabitants, left without heat, food, or electricity, to surrender. I believe that uh, the blockade of Berlin was a bad mistake on the part of Stalin. Uh, his hopes, apparently, Western powers would uh, either have to uh, withdraw from West Berlin. I do not think that he envisaged the possibility uh, that uh, they would be able to set up an air bridge. Allied air forces under US General Lucius Clay took up the challenge. A call went out for volunteer pilots. There was one route the Soviets couldn't close, the bridge in the sky. The Berlin airlift would attempt to supply a city of millions, totally by air. For eight months, every two minutes, day and night, in spite of the danger, in spite of threats from East German interceptors in all kinds of weather, the Allied pilots brought in supplies. 270,000 flights, a million 800,000 tons of cargo, from coal to milk to food, a fantastic, heroic operation of mercy and of defiance. The kindness of the Allies toward their recent mortal enemy took the world by surprise and astonished the Russians. Stalin was infuriated in his massive land force of two million troops and tens of thousands of tanks outnumbered the Allies. Worried that Stalin would risk a war to occupy West Berlin, the Allies concentrated 90 nuclear bombers in Britain. President Truman made it clear that he would order a nuclear strike at Soviet bases in East Germany. The first atomic confrontation had begun. For 270 days, the world teetered on the brink of nuclear war. Then Stalin weakened. On May 12, 1949, he lifted the blockade. 
Humbled by American nuclear power, Stalin urged his scientists to hurry. Soon, the Soviet A-bomb was completed and tested. The dangerous game of nuclear brinkmanship, of threat and bluff, had begun. The world was on a potentially fatal collision course when suddenly fate took a hand. On the 5th of March, 1953, Joseph Stalin suddenly died. His successor would likely be one of three men. Prime Minister Georgi Malenkov, Communist Party boss Nikita Khrushchev, or Lavrenti Beria, the sinister chief of Stalin's secret service, master of the Gulag, head of the Soviet military complex. But Beria was not a true communist, not even a true believer. He was an opportunist. He was also more worldly than his provincial Politburo rivals. His secret agents had given him a window in the West, and he knew the main secret of the Cold War. The West was economically superior. Free trade and modern government was a powerful engine. Communism in the long run could not win. After the death of Stalin, people find it very hard to believe uh, that the Soviet Union offered to join NATO. And this was the, the deal that uh, Beria did, or attempted to do. Beria wanted to turn to the West. His first step would be in Berlin. According to Beria's plan, all of East Germany would be returned to the West. The Soviets would be paid $10 billion in reparations. In the summer of 1953, Beria arrived in Berlin to speak with the East German government. But he made a fatal mistake. He underestimated the East German ruler's desire to remain in power, even as puppets of the Soviet Union. As soon as Beria left for Moscow, an uprising broke out in East Berlin. For many years, it's been believed that this riot had purely economic roots that people were demonstrating for food, for a better living standard. But in fact, this insurrection was planned, provoked by the East German government. They requested Soviet tanks to involve Moscow to compromise Beria's plans and to prevent Germany from being reunited. When Beria returned to Moscow, he was arrested, the result of a plot by Khrushchev. He was declared an imperialist agent and executed in December 1953. A new actor took the world stage. Nikita Khrushchev, the gruff, bear-like, strong-willed party boss, became head of the Soviet Union. He would lead the Soviet Empire during the most dangerous period in world history. In 1953, new leaders came into office on both sides of the Cold War. Retired General Dwight David Eisenhower was elected President of the United States, and Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev became Premier of the Soviet Union. The Cold Warriors had first met in Moscow in 1946 at a May Day parade when Stalin invited General Eisenhower to the reviewing stand on the mausoleum in Red Square. Eisenhower's style was to lead by consensus. He'd held together a fractious coalition against the Nazis and now held out hope for a rapprochement with the Soviet Union. But in the following years, mutual distrust grew. Relations between the United States and the Soviet Union rapidly deteriorated. By 1959, the tensions surrounding West Berlin became critical. We will not let anybody into West Berlin. All rights to decide who enters belongs to the government of East Germany and to nobody else. Unlike Beria, Khrushchev had no intention of giving either West Berlin or Germany to the West. Attempts to 
uh, arm West Germany were continued, the division of Germany was continued, and there was no return move on the part of the United States. When, in 1960, Eisenhower asked Khrushchev to visit the United States, the Soviet leader interpreted the invitation to be a result of his pressure on West Berlin. It seemed that face to face, the two ex-generals might find it easier to understand each other. Hard-nosed and ambitious, Khrushchev respected Eisenhower. He was eager to reform his country and to position it as one of the two world powers. To achieve his goals, Khrushchev was prepared to take risks. East and West agreed to meet in Paris in 1960. Khrushchev invited Eisenhower to visit the Soviet Union. But soon events took place which would prolong the Cold War for another three decades. The West was deeply concerned about Russian nuclear developments. Since the early 50s, the US had conducted active air reconnaissance over Soviet territory. The Soviets were aware of the U.S. flights. They hunted these planes. 252 American airmen were shot down. 24 were killed. 90 survived. 138 were missing in action. But for their own reasons, each side kept the secret. The destiny of dozens of these Americans remains unknown. As losses grew, the flights were stopped. But in 1956, the U.S. developed a new weapon of the Cold War, a reconnaissance plane which flew at extremely high altitudes, the U-2. This plane seemed impervious. Soviet anti-aircraft missiles and interceptors simply could not reach it. Overflights of Soviet territory were ordered. During Khrushchev's visit to the United States, the missions were stopped. But soon after his departure, the flights were renewed. And the first flight was blown in his face. He told that Americans told that we are not equal. They can do everything when they want over our territory. He refused after the first flight even to send the notes of the protest. He told, I'm just see." How all of them laughing on me in the Washington DC that I can do nothing with them. Infuriated, Khrushchev hastily announced the formation of new strategic missile forces. It was more bluff and bluster than substance. They had only a few dozen missiles, but Khrushchev managed to keep this weakness a secret. These missiles were seen as a new and dangerous threat by the West. The Americans were concerned. What kind of forces? Where are they located? Though Eisenhower was against it, CIA director Alan Dulles convinced him to allow a few more flights. Eisenhower preferred caution, especially before the summit in Paris. But under pressure, he reluctantly gave permission for two overflights. The last would take place no later than May 1st, 1960. On the 9th of April, a U-2 plane appeared in the Soviet sky. Anti-aircraft stations tried to reach it with missiles. Fighters were sent up to intercept it, all without results. It passed over Russian territory safely and returned with vital photo reconnaissance. The second flight was scheduled for the very end of April. But the weather turned bad. The missions were canceled. Then, on the last day allowed by the president, on the 1st of May, the weather cleared. The plane, piloted by a civilian employee of the CIA, took off from a secret air base in Peshawar, Pakistan. Once more, its route went over the top secret Semipalatinsk nuclear test ground, over military space fields and missile test grounds in Baikonur in Plisetsk. In the U.S., nobody paid attention to the date, but in the Soviet Union, May Day was the most important national holiday celebrated by a traditional military parade through Red Square. Khrushchev took the U-2 flight on this day as a personal insult. Our station spot the plane, follow it. In the morning of May Day, they immediately report everything to Khrushchev. We're all summoned to headquarters. 
All very nervous. Telephone steaming. The plane goes on. Two Soviet fighters were scrambled to attempt a high altitude intercept. The U-2 approached the missile station in Sverdlovsk. Unknown to the Americans, new C-75 missiles were based there. These missiles could reach 80,000 feet. One of them hit the U-2's tail. The plane started falling, but Russian radar could not discern this. To the radar operators, it looked like the U-2 was creating interference to mask its position. The Russians fired again. A missile hit a Russian interceptor. The Russian pilot was killed as the American bailed from his stricken craft. As he reviewed the military parade, Khrushchev got a report. The American U-2 had been intercepted. The pilot, Francis Gary Powers, captured. Then my father, after parade, he called and laughed. He told, we shot him, we carpooted this guy. Now we will show these Americans that, that, that they cannot do this anymore on our territory. Khrushchev was ready to accept Eisenhower's apologies. He suggested that Eisenhower come to Paris one day early to settle the problem. Eisenhower refused. Khrushchev was in high spirits on the way to Paris. He said, the decision has been taken that uh, at the summit, I will say uh, that Eisenhower should say he is sorry about the U-2 plane. Khrushchev tried to use the incident to pressure Eisenhower to force a Western retreat from Berlin. He wanted Eisenhower to apologize, to punish those responsible. Eisenhower refused. Khrushchev canceled the summit. When British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan arrived, he was surprised to learn the summit was over before it began. An infuriated Khrushchev held a press conference once more threatening the West. We did not finish you off at Stalingrad, in the Ukraine, at Belarusia. But if you dare try to scare us again, planning attacks on us, we'll kick you so hard you'll never risk it again. Commissar Khrushchev and General Eisenhower were allies during the war. They'd fought against fascism and defeated it, but they were unable to overcome the hostility and mistrust born in the Cold War. Now Khrushchev prepared for clashes with a new U.S. commander-in-chief. John Fitzgerald Kennedy was elected president in November 1960. He was young and vigorous. He represented change. People were tired of the Cold War. Both sides eagerly awaited the results of a summit in Vienna in June 1961. The topics were West Berlin and the problem of nuclear missiles, which according to Khrushchev, the Soviet Union was producing like sausages. At the summit, Khrushchev said that if the Berlin problem could not be solved jointly, he himself would settle it once and forever. Kennedy suggested that there could be a war. Well, if a war is to begin, let it be sooner rather than later, Khrushchev replied. Khrushchev told him that we can destroy you. Not all United States, but your main cities. You can destroy us. Then Kennedy told, we can destroy you 20 times. He told, we are not uh, so bloody as you. We don't need to destroy you many times. We will kill you only once. It's enough. Returning from Vienna, Kennedy was worried. He said, this winter will be rather cold. Khrushchev, an experienced politician of the Stalin school, was looking for a solution to the Berlin problem. Now he thought he had found it. On August 13th, 1961, news from Germany shocked the world. East German soldiers were surrounding West Berlin with barbed wire. When Kennedy got the news, he was stunned. The U.S. had developed several plans for dealing with such a crisis. Now Kennedy was briefed. 
he learned that all the plans included one extremely drastic provision. And the question was, how do you defend Berlin with 12,000 troops when they've got two million? Or how do you, what do you do? And the answer is always, well, you go this way and you go that way and then you use nuclear weapons. If that had happened, the first thing that would have occurred is that the Americans would have used tactical nuclear weapons. And they would have probably destroyed most of East Berlin and all the Soviet soldiers in it. And now what happens after that? after you've already started a nuclear war. Neither Kennedy nor the military knew what Khrushchev and the East Germans intended. Would they risk war to drive the West out of Berlin? For several days, tension grew. Then the East Germans eased the crisis. They declared that closing the border did not affect the Allies' rights. They still had open access to West Berlin. Closing the border was not to trap the Westerners in Berlin, as the West feared, but to prevent East Germans from escaping to the West. Kennedy and the military breathed a sigh of relief. The time for extreme measures had not yet come. Soon, East Germany started replacing the barbed wire surrounding the city with a concrete wall. The conflict built. On October 25th, American tanks rushed to Checkpoint Charlie, the primary border crossing between East and West. Russian tanks drove up to confront them. The tanks faced off, engines running 50 yards apart. Tension grew rapidly. Nerves could fail. Someone could open fire. For three days, shocked Berliners watched the standoff. A clash seemed unavoidable. What nobody knew was that neither Kennedy nor Khrushchev had ordered this confrontation. Even today, nobody can explain why the American and Russian tanks were sent to Checkpoint Charlie, or who sent them. It's a mystery of the Cold War. The leaders of both countries kept silent during the standoff. Both tried to play down the incident, undertaken without their consent. Russian and American tanks stood facing each other, eyeball to eyeball, rounds in the chamber. The Russians knew the American saying, he who blinks first loses. But Khrushchev winked. He moved the Russian tanks into side streets where they were unseen. Relieved, the American commanders pulled out. Again, the world had barely escaped a nuclear confrontation. Kennedy later expressed the American view, admitting in private conversation, the wall is better than the war. But then, three days later, shattering news. The Russians had detonated a super bomb. When I worked in general headquarters, I heard Soviet generals discussing the scientists, who are the most bloodthirsty beasts. Sometimes they bring such plans to us that we say, God, it's terrible. It's really inhuman. The designers of the super bomb gave it a very Russian name, Ivan. It equaled 50 million tons of TNT, or 1 million train boxcars loaded with explosives, 2,500 times the power of the bomb that leveled Hiroshima. The bomber had a special coating to protect it from the heat wave. The enormous bomb had to be fixed to the belly of the plane. It was too big for the bomb bay. The explosion took place at an altitude of 15,000 feet. It had to be that high. At that altitude, the fireball did not touch the ground. It sucked in less soil, diminished radioactive contamination of the atmosphere. A 5,400-square-foot parachute would delay its fall. The bomber needed time to get away. These cameras were 60 miles from the epicenter. We were in the devil's jaws, the pilots said. The leg of the mushroom cloud was six miles wide. The radioactive fireball reached an altitude of 40 miles above the surface of the Earth. The explosion was beautiful, if I may say so as a scientist. <laughs>
The shockwave of the monstrous explosion traveled a thousand miles. It broke windows in Norway and Finland. These pictures were taken 500 miles from the epicenter. But then the scientists had the most monstrous idea of all. It has been written as fiction, but the plan was all too real. But there was another, even more terrible, savage project, codenamed Doomsday. It was developed as the ultimate measure. If we lose a war, if communism is dying, why should anybody survive? The project was to design a bomb, which, if exploded, would cause all life on Earth to be terminated. This bomb was to be built inside a huge ship. The Ivan bomb, some 30 feet in length, had shocked the entire world. This nuclear device would destroy it. The ship itself would be the bomb. The entire hold would be filled with fissionable material. The structure of the vessel and the water it sailed in would vaporize. It would fill Earth's atmosphere with a radioactive cloud. The ship was to sail along the Soviet borders, its meters constantly monitoring radiation levels. If ever they registered radiation that indicated nuclear apocalypse in the Soviet Union, they would automatically trigger the monstrous bomb. Mankind would be destroyed. But the bomb to end the world would be automatic, out of control. Even a Cold War risk taker such as Khrushchev could not take that risk. He banned the idea. The doomsday machine was never built. The new year in 1962 could have become the last in human history. Doomsday might have come as a consequence of the Cold War perhaps as its logical conclusion. 1961, maybe into 1962, that little period was the period in which the United States, for the last time, would, in, would enjoy such superiority over the Soviet Union in both bombers and missiles and any other kind of delivery systems that it would conceivably be possible, this was the theory, to attack the Soviet Union, destroy Soviet communism forever, and have no damage. By 1962, the Russians had a problem. The United States had a 17 to 1 superiority in nuclear missiles and warheads. More frightening was the fact that the US missiles were based in Great Britain, Italy, and Turkey. They could reach population centers in the Soviet Union in under 10 minutes. The Soviets had no forward bases. Their missiles had to be launched from Soviet territory and needed 25 minutes to reach US targets. To the Soviets, this disadvantage gave the U.S. the opportunity to launch a first strike. Khrushchev desperately sought a means to balance the nuclear threat. And I do not believe, and I never have believed, by the way, that the Soviet Union was, was unequivocally, permanently, unmistakably aggressive. We've never taken, and this is one of the origins of the Cold War problem, as a matter of fact, taken at least regard for Russian legitimate defensive interests. In 1962, Khrushchev made a dangerous and secret move. For a while, it remained secret. Then, on October 14, 1962, an American U-2 plane on a reconnaissance mission over Cuba took a series of high-resolution exposures. Experts in the CIA laboratories analyzed the photos and came to a highly alarming conclusion. Soviet medium-range missiles have been installed in Cuba, 90 miles from the United States. They were discovered by chance. One day, the Soviets forgot to camouflage their sights. The discovery shocked the Americans. On the 22nd of October, President John Kennedy addressed the nation. Shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile 
launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace. At any minute, the developing crisis could turn into a global nuclear war with Cuba as its trigger. The roots of this drama go back to 1959, when Fidel Castro seized power. As a communist, he had reason to worry that the United States would take action against his regime. An alliance with the Russian was his best hope for survival. For Khrushchev, the enemy of his enemy was his friend. First, Raul Castro, in the summer of 61, goes to Moscow to ask for help. Che Guevara and a bunch of his people go in August to ask for help. It turns out that in April, a trip was made that we didn't know about, we found out recently. Uh, che Guevara goes back and asks, and I've seen the document. The document says, we need help qualitatively different than anything we have received before. He didn't ask for nuclear weapons, but what could he possibly be talking about? Because they've already got tanks and MiGs and soldiers and guns and boats and so forth. Khrushchev loved the style of diplomacy that relied on a nuclear bluff. He wrote to Castro, now with our missiles we can hit a fly. That's great, Castro replied, but how about hitting the US? Perhaps at that moment, Khrushchev got the idea. In June 1962, under the cover of large-scale war games, the Russians brought troops, equipment, and arms to Soviet seaports. The troops were secretly loaded into dozens of cargo ships, destination unknown. Only later, the ship captains were informed. They were headed for Cuba. 42,000 soldiers were kept in the ship's holds under top security. Only at night could they go on deck for fresh air. It was Khrushchev who did it all with his closest associates. I was chairman of the KGB, and I still did not know of nuclear warheads being delivered there. Nobody asked my advice. It was one of the greatest secret operations of the 20th century, but the secrecy itself was very nearly a catastrophic mistake. When the Americans discovered the missiles, the Russians needed only two and a half hours more to make the missiles operational. Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko and Ambassador Dobrynin tried to convince President Kennedy that there were no Soviet missiles in Cuba. They lied. The secret installation and continued lying by the Russians indicated to the American government that these missiles were intended for a secret strike against the U.S. To Kennedy and his advisors, the nuclear threat was very real. They discussed and argued over their options to find a response, to safeguard their people and their country while preventing an all-out nuclear war. Of all possible countermeasures from invasion to threat to nuclear first strike, Kennedy chose the most balanced one. He ordered a sea blockade of Cuba. Americans lived through terrifying days Panic started. People bought out food supplies. They feared U.S. military action against Cuba and a retaliatory strike at the U.S. The nuclear nightmare had become reality. The American Navy took positions along a blockade line around Cuba. Because of the time difference, it was evening when the Russians got the news of Kennedy's speech and the American response. Khrushchev had misjudged Kennedy. He'd sensed weakness at the summit in Vienna. Now he was surprised and frightened by the U.S. resolve. U.S. nuclear missiles, now on alert, were targeted at 200 Soviet cities and strategic sites. The Americans were enraged. Khrushchev immediately summoned his closest circle. He was extremely nervous. He was at a loss. He did not expect such reaction, such behavior from the Americans. 
He looked for a way out. Soviet ships were nearing the blockade line. Some carried our 14 nuclear missiles with enough warheads to cover the entire United States. The U.S. had indicated its intent to prevent this by force. He said, well, uh, the missiles are now approaching Cuba. Uh, they will be in place there, and we're approaching a big blow up. He said, well, it's too late to change anything now. The missile-carrying ships were accompanied by Soviet submarines equipped with nuclear torpedoes. U.S. Coast Guard planes registered their engine noise. Tensions grew. The distance between the American and Soviet ships grew smaller, smaller. Soviet freighters were now two hours from the quarantine zone. The crisis crackled and sparked, you know, like a high-tension cable which has dropped on you and sparking in all directions. And uh, speaking for myself, actually, I just wondered, how are we going to get out of this? I mean, it was Wednesday. Then you've got this other problem, you know, of the, of the naval blockade, uh, of the Soviet ships moving to the blockade. Would they stop? What happens if they didn't stop? Khrushchev still delayed his decision, hoping for a miracle. But there was no way out. He ordered the missile-carrying ships to stop, then to turn back. On the 24th of October, the military clash was avoided. But what would have happened if Khrushchev's orders had come too late? The Americans won the first round. The Soviet ships carrying missiles turned back. But the key problem remained. Soviet nuclear weapons were still in Cuba. The US prepared for military action. Troops were sent to Florida and to the Caribbean. Moscow became extremely worried. On the 27th of October, the CIA ordered a U-2 on a reconnaissance mission over the Soviet pads to determine whether they were ready to launch missiles. Cuban anti-aircraft guns opened a barrage fire, but the U-2's altitude was too great. They could not reach it. Then the U-2 appeared on Russian radar screens. One of the Russian officers gave the order to fire. The battery was equipped with the new Russian C-75 missiles. Unknown to the Americans, they could reach the U-2's altitude. The missile tracked the American reconnaissance plane. Neither Moscow nor the commander of the Soviet troops in Cuba had given the order. Neither Moscow nor the commander was aware of the launch. The American plane was hit. The pilot, Major Rudolf Anderson, died in the crash. It was clear to Kennedy and his advisors that only a Russian missile could reach the plane. They couldn't imagine that it could have been launched without a direct order from Moscow. Did it mean the Russians were starting the war? To the Cold Warriors, it seemed so. The American generals insisted that Kennedy order an immediate preemptive strike on Cuba before the Russians could launch their remaining missiles at the United States. At this moment, Kennedy received a telegram from the US Embassy in Moscow. The embassy had just received a most urgent message from Khrushchev. The future US ambassador Matlock was to translate it speaks excellent Russian, so they rely on him. But everybody in Washington is saying, hurry up, I need it now. And he, he's saying, do you know how hard it is to translate Khrushchev? I mean, Khrushchev is a peasant, and he uses all this sort of uh, not so nice language. You know, while back in Washington, they're wringing their hands, you know, trying to figure out when the next piece of the letter is coming in. When Washington got the message, the Americans were confused. Then it became clear Khrushchev was still trying to bargain. He didn't realize how critical the situation had become. It seemed he didn't know about the attack on the U-2 and therefore hadn't intended it. Pressed by his advisors and by the clear threat to US security, Kennedy had no choice but to send Khrushchev an ultimatum. All he could do was to soften its style. 
Robert Kennedy informed the Russian ambassador that if the Soviet Union didn't remove the missiles from Cuba, the U.S. was ready to start a large-scale operation to destroy them. To back up the ultimatum, Kennedy alerted the U.S. military forces. Now the U.S. and Soviet Union were one step away from nuclear war. But now the American position was fixed. The initiative, the sole decision over whether the world would plunge into nuclear war, was in the heart of one man, Nikita Khrushchev. This is the only time in history that the nuclear missile sites in North Dakota and in Nebraska had the lids removed. But clearly, there's a message being sent here. I've hit that button, and there's only one button left to hit. The Soviets reacted immediately. The lids on their launch pads opened to bear the missiles. Both American and Soviet strategic nuclear bombers took off. The Soviet army declared a red alert Along with their East European satellites, NATO went to full alert. In the night of October 27th, 28th, Castro sent a coded telegram to Moscow. According to his information, the United States intended to invade Cuba within 24 hours. Only then did Khrushchev realize the gravity of the situation. If Americans landed in Cuba, the disaster was inevitable for Khrushchev had another deadly secret. The greatest Soviet secret, one that was not revealed for 30 years, was that beside the medium-range nuclear missiles known to the Americans, there were other nuclear weapons in Cuba. Weapons unknown to the US president, to the generals, to the CIA. In Cuba, the Soviets had secretly placed winged tactical Luna missiles with nuclear warheads. They had bombers on Cuban airstrips and boats armed with nuclear missiles. These weapons had no fail-safe devices. They could be triggered by their crews. Moscow was not in control. But he tried to avoid invasion because he understood he will lose the control over the situation because communications are very poor at that time. And who will make decision to use nuclear weapons? Nobody knows. Because it was very easy at that time. You can switch the key, like in the car, and then push the button. It was a nightmare to my father. You can imagine, in all this uh, fire, explosion, dying lieutenant, captain, surgeon, will push this button, and then, at last, it will be the end of the world, the end of the civilization. Khrushchev gave instructions to call a Politburo meeting uh, the next morning on the 28th. And I was there, and it took place uh, at a dacha outside of Moscow. It was decided to uh, give an answer as soon as possible. Nikita Khrushchev loved the nuclear bomb. He loved the power it gave him. He embraced the policy of nuclear bluff. He was comfortable on the brink of nuclear war. He was the biggest brinksman of the 20th century. But now he'd come too close to the edge, to within a blink of nuclear disaster, of the end of civilization. It sobered him. And he realized the only way to preserve peace, to protect his country, to prevent a worldwide catastrophe, was to remove the missiles from Cuba. In return, President Kennedy agreed to remove U.S. missiles from Turkey. The Cuban crisis was over, but not the Cold War. It would last for another 30 years. There would be wars in Africa, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Afghanistan, uprisings in Eastern Europe, and many other conflicts. But never again did one side directly threaten the other with nuclear weapons.
The weapons were too deadly, too final, and finally too hard to control. The two superpowers backed off from direct confrontation. From now on, the war would be fought by surrogates armed with everything but nuclear devices. The leaders and the world had been scared straight. By the end of the 20th century, the Cold War had become history, and the strange love factor, the realization of the inherent insanity of nuclear conflict, may have saved the world.